Welcome to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession on the world's number one chiropractic podcast. Before we dive into this powerful episode, please remember to subscribe to our channels and give us a five-star rating on iTunes to continue hustling. This episode is sponsored by the Transact Card, Align Life, Brain-Based Health Solutions, Cairo HD, Imaging Services, Cairo Health USA, Cairo Moguls, Pure Cairo Notes, Titronics, German College of Chiropractic, New Patients in a Box, Life Chiropractic College West, Pro Hockey Cairos, Pro Baseball Cairos, the IFCO, and 100% Chiropractic, Let's Hustle. Hey guys, welcome to episode 535 of the Cairo Hustle podcast. I'm your producer, Luke Millette, and here's your host, James Chester. So today we had the opportunity of interviewing Dr. Mark Lamantia. If you want to hear the story about how scoliosis is shaping the future of chiropractic, stay tuned. Welcome back. This is another episode of the Cairo Hustle podcast. Today I have Mark Lamantia coming on with me. I'm really excited because this guy is going to talk all things scoliosis. Um, we're going to talk about some epigenetics. That's a new study that people are, are uh, including into the chiropractic conversation. And uh, something newer that I am unaware of is DNA methylation. So I'm going to let Dr. Mark be the expert on that today. Um, but before we get into this episode of 535, I'm going to let everybody know the big why. Why do we do what we do over here at Cairo Hustle? Well, first things first, um, as a journalist, um, I didn't tell you that either, but my background's in journalism. Um, as a journalist, I believe in uh, the First Amendment, which is freedom of speech. And I think it's important for people to speak uh, their truth and not be censored. And over the past couple of years, we've seen that become uh, a real concern for um, people being shadow banned and platform removed and things like that. So uh, we believe in freedom of speech. We also believe in uh, medical freedom and family health freedom. Those are not the same thing, but uh, I think that they're both really important to everybody who listens to our show. And uh, if they took that away from you, it'd be devastating. So um, we get a bit more philosophical with the messaging of what we do over here at Cairo Hustle, but we do protect BJ Palmer sacred trust with our show. And that is uh, his last words. If you want to know more about chiropractic, go and search for BJ Palmer's last words or BJ Palmer sacred trust. And you're going to learn more about chiropractic than what you previously did. Even if you're a chiropractor, I guarantee you. Um, and then we uh, also support subluxation based chiropractic. Um, don't remove it from our schools. Don't remove it from the lexicon of this profession. It, belongs in the profession. And then last, um, we also believe in innate intelligence and universal intelligence. We believe that when man or woman, the physical gets adjusted, it connects them to man or woman, the spiritual. And with that, Dr. Mark, welcome to the show. Awesome, man. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. I mean, I had like the best conversation of the day, um, listening to you explain to me some of the things that you do, um, that, include chiropractic into it with uh, the process of scoliosis, scoliosis and you know where we are, where we're going, and there's a lot that goes into it. So I'm going to save that for uh, maybe take two of, of today's conversation, but I'm really curious. Um, you know, you said you've been in the profession for 20 years. Oh boy. I graduated in 96. So I guess we're going on 28 years, 28 years. So almost yeah. three decades of being a chiropractor. Yeah. Yeah. When you <laughs> sign up, they don't tell you that there's no way out. <laughs> <laughs> all my friends that became uh, policemen or union guys, they're all retiring, but in chiropractic you're in for life. And it's kind of like uh, the unspoken, uh, laws so uh, yeah 30 going on 30 if my math is correct going on 30 years in the profession and the best part of this profession is you can renew and uh remake yourself uh every seven years every seven years you can do something different in the profession and still be helping people and and still be growing and that's uh i think why chiropractors uh, are so passionate about their profession. Number one, we're always pushed against the wall. So we're always in a corner and we're, we're posturing to, to get out of that corner uh, alive. But uh, yeah, going on 30 years and um, 
you know, I started out, I don't, you, you do know, but not everybody else would know. I started out as an upper cervical provider, an upper cervical doctor. I did knee chest upper cervical. And uh, when I first started in practice, uh, that was, you know, that was the offering that you got when you came into my office. Um, and then as uh, time went on, I, I was looking for more. And uh, I don't know if you want me to go into my whole history of. Uh, well, let's do it. Yeah. So, uh, so I was a, a, a knee chest provider. I love the philosophy. I love the, the trilogy. You know, I love the science, the art and the philosophy, all three of them. And I'm, I was very, very passionate as a student and as a young doctor. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then I felt like I learned as much as I could uh, with, uh, from, you know, from my mentors at that time. And uh, Robert Kessinger was uh, one of my mentors, who's a, an upper cervical doctor. Um, at that time, he was in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Of course, Dr. Kale is a, someone I learned under. Uh, and, then, uh, and then I felt like I needed more. And, and then... And I'm sure everybody who's a chiropractor knows uh, Dr. Murphy, and he just blew me away with his his knowledge and and basically what he was teaching about the neurology of scoliosis. Or excuse me, the neurology of chiropractic. I wasn't into scoliosis specifically at this point in my career. I always had an interest in it, but at this point, I was doing uh, upper cervical care, and uh, then I met. Uh, 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 Murphy and I started to follow him and he basically told me, look, if you really like the neurology of what we're doing, you should go do the Carrick modules in the Carrick Institute. So then I got my diplomate in neurology through the Carrick Institute. And uh, I had a, uh, I had an ability to, to take what I was learning and turn it into clinical practice and make it a profit center in my practice. And that really helped me build my business so that uh, I can continue to provide care to the, you know, and do the things I wanted to do in practice. Um, and so the neurology really helped me. And I really always looked at it from a chiropractic perspective. How is the chiropractic adjustment affecting neurology? How can we use different interventions, uh, different whether it was uh, sensory activations from non-chiropractic or from a chiropractic adjustment. Uh, and then, and then I, uh, I met Dr. Gary Deutschman at that time, and he was treating scoliosis patients and doing it in what I considered a very archaic way, basically doing all the things that were done by the orthopedists or the, the, the physical medicine providers or manual medicine providers, over decades, which were to traction people or to put them in hard braces or to use electric stem. And basically from my neurology training, we decided that, look, if, if scoliosis is anything, it's a movement disorder. Because when you move, your, your, your posture is disorganized and your brain doesn't have a great perception of where you are in space. And so ultimately, once that curve happens, the curve happens for a different reason, let's say from neurological imbalance or, or DNA metabolic interaction uh, uh, imbalances that lead to asymmetric growth. But, uh, um, but scoliosis is, uh, you know, when you look at it, and I lost my train of thought there, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, do you remember the exact thing I was just telling you about? Oh, you're talking about the advancement of you coming from a, an upper cervical doc and starting with the Carrick Institute. Right, and, right. And then uh, the neurology and then the Carrick Institute. <laughs> and then uh, and then I met Dr. Deutschman, Dan who Murphy. was treating people kind of archaic. And we said, OK, well, let's put a, ne a neurology <laughs> spin on this. Yes. And that's basically what we did. Uh, and And from there, we started to really innovate and try to stop doing the same things that were done for 50 plus years, which were hard brace, bracing, tractioning, um, electric stim and so forth. Uh, and that's really how we came to uh, use flexible bracing, which is uh, a, an advancement in the way we, we use uh, bracing for scoliosis. I could talk a little bit about what flexible bracing is compared to the hard bracing. And then looking at neurological rehab as an approach to managing scoliosis, which clinically we were, in some regards, the only people doing that. Everyone else was treating it as an orthopedic problem, tractioning it, stretching it, trying to pull it or push it straight. And we decided to look at the, the nervous system and look at the, 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 
the postural reflexes as a primary target. And that was a big innovation. And I presented a paper in 2004 at the uh, SOSORT conference, which is an international consortium of non-surgical orthopedic providers. We were the only Americans there. Uh, we were the only chiropractors. They happened to mention chiropractic at this convention and say that it could cripple you and break your patients in half, and you should make sure you never send your, your uh, orthopedic referrals to a chiropractor. And of course, I stood up and I, I, uh, I said, I have to respectfully disagree. Uh, as a chiropractor, I could tell you that we do not break patients in half. They walk out of the office just the way they walk in. <laughs> and the things that you're saying are, you know, are, are not accurate. But uh, that was the beginning of, uh, of the explosion of non-surgical scoliosis management that's still growing in the United States today. Uh, we introduced the spine core brace back then to the chiropractic profession. That was in 2004, which is a flexible brace. It works on postural rehab as opposed to modulating growth, which is what the hard braces do. Then we started doing vestibular testing. That came from my training in the CARIC program. The vestibular system is like the internal gyroscopes of our body. And when those gyroscopes are disturbed, your brain perceives your body is in a different place than it really is. And it starts to try to correct where your body is through postural reflex. And this is how distortions, head tilts happen thoracic, lumbar distortions, it's all driven by the brain. And so what we do in, in the chiropractic management of scoliosis, if it's specific for scoliosis, is we just let that happen, and then we treat the physical deformity, just like the orthopedists do, just like the manual medicine crowd does. Chiropractic is not meant to be manual medicine. It is not a physical pushing and pulling to restore angles of joints it's a it really it's designed to improve nervous system function i mean that's the purpose of chiropractic so anything else that we use could be useful uh outside of let's say the adjustment but using the adjustment to try to straighten the spine in scoliosis is a bit of a pit it's a bit of a a, a, tr a clinical trap because the it's not that those 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 vertebrae are misaligned because they're subluxated. They're misaligned because they grew asymmetrically. So there's a deformity there. So you can't just push and pull it. It's like a tree that, or a tomato plant that grows, uh, you know, outside of the bounds where you want it to. You 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 can't force it back. It'll just crack the it'll just crack the uh, the stem. But you could encourage it to grow back using the innate intelligence of that plant by realigning it to grow differently. And that's what a hard brace is meant to do. Uh, so again, I'm always interested in the progress of how we can do things better. The biggest thing that I think that my company has brought to not only the profession, but ultimately the world is uh, to look at scoliosis more as a brain-based problem, more as a movement disorder that needs to be treated at the, the root problem, which is really starting with the nervous system and really backpedaling all the way back to how the DNA interacts. And of course, the nervous system influences how our DNA is expressed. And of course, you mentioned the epigenetics and DNA methylation as a way to actually measure if your DNA is being activated or suppressed. And I don't know how familiar you are with scoliosis, but scoliosis was always thought of as a genetic disorder. And so they said, well, if you got the genes for it, you're going to develop it and there's nothing you can do to, to, to change that. But we know now that from looking at uh, studies between identical twins, that it, there are uh, other reasons why curvatures progress other than genetics. And so we, we call that discordant uh, 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 responses between identical twins. If one, one identical twin has a small curvature and the other one develops a very large curvature, it tells you that the progression is not genetic because the genes are exactly the same in these, uh, you know, in these identical twins. So we already know that it's not, the progression is not genetically driven, but we still talk as if it is, we still treat people as if it's genetic and you can't change it. Uh, but epigenetics is, is really the key to understand why one twin would develop a larger curvature and why another twin wouldn't. 
and that has to do with the methylation status of their DNA. It's basically how well their DNA is, is covered by these methyl groups that suppresses the DNA from expressing diseased genes. And so those suppressor sites on the DNA, they could be methylated by good nutrition, good sleep, chiropractic care, uh, proper movement, stress reduction, anything that improves the, metabol uh, the, the metabolic health of a patient should improve their methylation status, which should improve the expression of their DNA. So we have to change, in my opinion, change gears to, to, to not just push and pull the curve so it looks straight in the short term, but we need to make sure we're stabilizing the DNA and improving the methylation status of the patient. So I would say to the manual therapists that are treating scoliosis, whether you're a chiropractor or not, by pushing and pulling the spine straight and then x-raying it and saying, well, look, it's straighter. I would challenge you to look at the methylation status of that patient before and after treatment. If you're improving the methylation status, then I 100% believe you are improving the longevity of that patient and most likely the stability of their curvature. If you're decreasing their methylation uh, um, status, you might be setting them up for further progression in the future, even though it might look straighter in the short term. Uh, it's like dieting. You know, you could, you could lose weight by starvation, but that's not going to stimulate healthy gene responses in your body. It's going to actually lead to disease processes to start, even though you look healthier, you look skinnier, those types of things. So I don't know if that's too rudimentary, but uh, that's, you know, th these are exciting times to be a chiropractor because we have at our fingertips all of this other knowledge and all this other technology. Uh, we're doing DNA methylation testing in our in our practice with our patients. Um when I first learned about this, this was something you can only get done through, through a research grant, and it wasn't really available to us. Now we have, you know, it's a click of a button. I use a company called True Diagnostics. I don't make any money to tell you about it, but I think they're awesome. It's a finger prick test, and you could test your patients and check their methylation status, their age, their rate of aging. You could test to see if they have genes that are being expressed for diabetes, obesity, uh, lots of different stuff. And then if you're a chiropractor and you intervene and you care for that patient and you retest them at some point in the future and you show that you've improved their methylation status, slowed their aging process, whatever uh, you want to look at, uh, you know, that's going to vet what we do as clinicians far greater than anything that I, you know, far greater than looking at an x-ray and saying, look, I took an x-ray and now their spine's straighter. There's ways to do that which are not meaningful. And there's ways when that happens that it's only transient and it doesn't last. So it doesn't impress anyone when you show an x-ray to a, a clinician who knows, well, that it could have looked like that that day, but how about six weeks later or a month later or three months later? So we need to create a stability that's long lasting for these patients. And that's why I think looking at some of these advances in technology for us as chiropractors will empower us to protect our profession because most people who are on this podcast would know our profession is under attack and they do not want us to take the lead on any of this, this changing of the guard that's occurring with, with healthcare. And they've basically, they've fast tracked the naturopaths right past us. So now naturopaths have a, you know, they have a, a greater status in the medical field than than the chiropractors do. And of course, we've been creating this field uh, for the past hundred years, in my opinion. You've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession on the world's number one chiropractic podcast. This episode is sponsored by the Transact Card, Align Life, Brain-Based Health Solutions, Cairo HD, Imaging Services, Cairo Health USA, Cairo Mobiles, Pure Cairo Notes, Titronics, German College of Chiropractic, New Patients in a Box, Life Chiropractic College West, Pro Hockey Cairos, Pro Baseball Cairos, the IFCO, and 100% Chiropractic, Let's Hustle. Yeah, you know, I, that's a lot of uh, specific conversation on how we've got to where we are 
um, within the chiropractic methods. And I, I believe that there's a lot of validation there when it comes to like the individual person. Um, I, I'm just really curious. These aren't like scripted questions, but I, 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 I'm just going to open up the conversation with you because scoliosis is the conversation. Yep. And, you know, when we were kids, I'm sure you've heard this time after time again, uh, the, the nurse at schools had us bend over and touch our toes to see if we had any like curve in our spine. Right. Right. Still and, doing it in, I think, 28 states. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're still doing conveyor belt like technology when it comes to like the medical model. Yeah. And, and we're still doing like outdated stuff. So you're talking still about a lot of advanced things like right. shooting x-rays and pulling the spine and, you know, trying to get it back as straight as possible. Like, but if, if that's still not the, the path that we should be on, um, I'm still curious. Like the next topic is the Harrington rods. Like yeah. if we can't do it the way that, you know, you know, through a brace system, then Damn it! We're gonna cut you open, and we're gonna, we're gonna do place, one way or another. Absolutely, we're gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna bolt this thing together and make it go straight, whether you want it to or not, or if it's supposed to stay that way. Right. And what have we done in the chiropractic profession? But but try to emulate that by putting people in traction machines and forcing them straight over hours in a traction chair. Uh, there's a there's an autonomic price to pay when you put somebody in traction, even when you you know the, like the Gambali chairs from years ago. Uh, you know, what we really should do, and, and, and I use those in my practice, but I would put a heart rate monitor on the patient to see what it was doing to the nervous system. Mm. Because there's, you know, you're not just stretching the ligaments and the, and the, and the discs that you look at on the x-ray, but you're stretching blood vessels. You're physiology. Stretching, you're stretching yeah, the physiology of the yeah, person. Yeah, you're pushing on kidneys if you're pushing in the low, side of the low back with the, one of these rolls or something, and you leave it there mm -hmm. for hours or days or mm -hmm. make people sleep on it. You know, there's, there's risk when you intervene with a patient. And uh, in chiropractic, we, we don't always look at, you know, we don't follow the scientific method always to, to vet a, an intervention. We come up with a theory, we try it, we kind of are un, uh, unregulated in that regard and practice. I mean, I could do whatever I want tomorrow with a patient and, and try to see if it makes a, a change or or the patient feels better. But that anecdotal evidence, there's, it's, it's low level evidence, but we tend to sometimes operate off of that. And I think that's what happened with scoliosis and chiropractic is we were like, hey, let's save kids from the rods in their back. So we'll just stretch them and traction them and save them the rod. And we'll do the same thing as the rod would do or what the hard brace would do. You know, I said earlier, you know, where's the innovation? For me, the stagnation of innovation is, is, is a, you know, it's the, the death card for our profession, even though historically we was, you know, we were taught we have to preserve the sacred trust from BJ and we have to, you know, uh, not sully and, and, and def defame the profession by doing things that are, you know, watering down the message of the philosophy and so forth. But we also need to innovate and come up with what's next because let's face it if chiropractic was everything bj palmer had told us it was it was touted as one one cause one cure we you know chiropractors would be living forever or would be living without disease and this is you know when i became a chiropractor this is what i thought like wow all this stuff i'm learning so this means I'm not going to die of a heart attack like the other men in my family. Does this mean I'm not going to end up with arthritis? Does this mean is you know is chiropractic going to save me from all those things? And then of course, as I age in the profession, and I saw other like my mentors aging, and they were having similar afflictions to everybody else on the planet, I then thought to myself, well, it's not a cure-all. It's not going to stop you from getting cancer or heart disease or any of those things in and of itself. You know, it might be part of a healthy lifestyle. It might be a way to better methylate your DNA, which of course we never thought of that before. But, um, but so, so I think chiropractors got, in my opinion, uh, they got sidetracked when it came to scoliosis 
because they started to treat it as, as manual medicine practitioners and not chiropractors. And I'm not saying that I'm better than anyone. And, and I don't treat it as a chiropractor. I don't treat scoliosis with chiropractic. I recommend that my patients see a chiropractor, or if I'm doing the chiropractic side of it, then they can see me as well. But a lot of the stuff I do is non-chiropractic. So I, by no means do I mean that, well, if you don't do chiropractic, you're wrong, or if you won't use chiropractic to treat it. But Chiropractic has a specific uh, value to mankind. It restores something in the nervous system or within the physical body that restores the communication systems within that body. It's not meant to be a treatment to straighten spines when really we're talking about an organism where not only the bones are misshapen, but the brain is misshapen. So if you take a scoliosis patient and you force their spine straight and they have a curved brain, for lack of better terms, asymmetric growth in the brain, uh, asymmetric communication hubs, this has all been shown in the science. That's what's happening in scoliosis. The manifestation is in the spine. So then we're like, oh, chiropractor, we must fix that because we're spine doctors. Orthopedist says, oh, I'm going to fix that because I can put a rod in there. But, but down to the DNA of that patient, there is a twist that is manifesting not only in the spine, but also in all of the nervous system and also all of the DNA of the patient. Even the platelets in scoliosis patients don't work the same because they're misshapen. I don't know how much you know about platelets, but platelets are proteins in the blood that contract to help clotting. They're, they're a contractile protein. Well, they're misshapen in scoliosis. So right there, we have to just stop what we're doing because trying to force a spine straight in a person that has a curved brain curved bones of their skulls so they're the little gyroscopes in their inner ear are not lined up properly their um their blood is abnormal and then we're coming in and we're just going to force the spine straight like manual medicine doctors and that works sometimes uh, to stop the curvature of the pro progression it never really when we treat the physical curve it's rare that we improve function doing that so again, our approach is always to try to improve function over form and then hope the form follows to, to stay stable. Like you could do anything to a spine to straighten, like traction somebody for, for let's say six hours and then x-ray them and it'll look straighter. But over time, as gravity and movement set in, you lose that benefit. And so then what is the value of making it straight for that short period of time? unless you're going to always do that, always do that, always do that, which is another approach of some clinicians. But better if we could stabilize the DNA, stabilize the nervous system, and then allow the patient to live well with the curvature instead of trying to cure it. But because we can't, we can't cure it. We just have to teach patients and, and give them the tools to live well with it. So that's what I've been trying to do for the past 20 years. Yeah. You know, a lot of these things that you're saying, uh, I hope it challenges the profession that listens to our show a little bit to um, become innovators within the, the next chapter of chiropractic. And I, I, I really hope that we write a better next chapter when it comes to um, where this profession is heading and what we have on our, what, what, what we have in our hands today, which is a really, it's a powerful profession in my opinion that, um, actually cares for people. And yeah. no, we're you know, in a great position. We, yeah. We've given up a lot of our positioning over the years, I think. Um, and it's been filled by other, other professions. Like I said earlier, the naturopaths, they're, they're booming. They're doing amazing. And uh, yeah, I think what's going to, I think one of your questions you, you, you want us to prepare for was like, you know, where do you see the profession in the future or, or mm -hmm. something like that? it really just depends on what, what road we take. You know, our schools are changing their names from chiropractic schools to physical medicine schools or health sciences schools. Uh, so we're definitely losing our identity. We're under attack in the media and by mainstream medicine. And then of course, within our own profession, we've got uh, a dichotomy or a split that, that weakens us. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that technology is one of the things that can save us to help vet uh, the effects of what we do. And of course, the world's changing so much. It may go back to a, 
uh, touchy feely world at some point here because technology may be so dangerous as AI emerges and uh, UAP and NHI and all the things that are happening in the world right now. Who knows? Maybe, you know, low tech, high touch is going to be what saves us. But for me in my practice, what's made my business viable and what's made me really passionate about doing what I do is the ability to incorporate all this different technology, whether it's the braces or exercise methods from from uh, from Germany, like the Schroth method. I was one of the first uh, chiropractors, maybe the first chiropractor to ever be trained in the Schroth method, which is a German method for managing scoliosis using manual therapy and exercise. But all of these advances and, and the epi, epigenetic testing, I think, is fantastic. I do a lot of nutritional, uh, functional nutrition in my practice now as well. So these are advances that all chiropractors could be could be implementing if they felt it, it, it didn't sully or water down what they're doing as a, as a professional. And for me, they don't. I know some of my, my colleagues do. Some of my fraternity brothers don't really talk to me from when I was in chiropractic school because they think that I've strayed from the, uh, you know, from from what uh, the sacred trust has asked us to do. I don't believe I have. I think I'm innovating for a specific condition as a chiropractor, and I never, I never have never changed what I believe chiropractic is. And as an upper cervical doctor, I feel I have a strong sense of what it is that a chiropractor is doing with a patient. And uh, yeah, I'm not against you doing something different, but I just, I think in scoliosis, we've, we've fallen into this trap to try to reproduce what the orthopedists are doing uh, and using, you know, even like something like the clear method, which I have a lot of respect for uh, the doctors that, that do this technique in chiropractic. Um, but they've, they've, uh, advanced to the point now where they're now using hard braces. Hard bracing is a technology from 1940. So we're just starting to use that now. The clear method was a technique where they use traction and these orthopedic non-brace methods to try to manage the physical curvature. And again, they were successful doing that. They could make your curve look less. Uh, but in the name of progress, they added hard bracing to their treatment. And to me, that's going in reverse. That's like not what we want to do. We want to try to get away from treating the physical if there is a way to do that. Uh, but at the very least, I think we've got to include all this other technology uh, to help patients the best we can. Well, Dr. Mark, um, we had quite the, uh, the message there on the how scoliosis is... Um, on the next chapter of chiropractic and how we can get more people understanding the epigenetic, um, the way that that deals with like the individual and not the, the, the way people are born into something, you know, like when I was working in a clinic all the time, people would like to say, Oh, it just runs in the family. Right. And, I, and I'd be like, no, it doesn't like yeah. the, the first way to get di diabetes is through your eyes. And it's because <laughs> you don't control what you eat. Right. And, and if you want to reverse type two diabetes, stop eating that crap right. and start and start 30 minutes of walking every day, drink half of your body weight in ounces of water every day, sleep and uh, take care of your mental attitude. Yeah. And I think a lot of times when we think about chiropractic, a lot of times people want to overthink it. They want to like overcomplicate things. And um, there's always a burden of proof. Like you're messed up. You came to here with pain. Now right. it's my burden of proof to, to solve that for you. Otherwise, you're not going to believe in chiropractic. Right. And I, I, I close out by telling people, chiropractic is not a belief system. It's a healing art. And if people want a belief system, that's the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus. <laughs> and chiropractic is a healing art that checks, detects, and corrects vertebral subluxation. And I don't know anybody that walks around on planet Earth that's better off with subluxations in their spine. Um, I think that when people are actually like aligned neurologically, as you're saying, they have a better chance at having an epigenetic shift mm -hmm. and having a quality of life quotient, which all these insurance companies want anyways. They want activities of daily living to improve in order to show that chiropractic actually worked. Well, 
what actually works is people at getting care from somebody that actually does a proper exam on them that actually listens to what's going on with them, acknowledges them for what's going on with them, and then puts their hands on them and adjusts them. That's the quotient of how people start to feel better because we live in this touchless society where people don't have anybody listening to them, acknowledging them, caring for them. And doctors of chiropractic are touch healers. They touch people, they make them actually feel like something's happening and then the shift is in them. So I really believe that if chiropractors are going to steer the ship from crashing to the rocks, it's going to be about the patient and it's going to be about the, the, the care that's delivered and the people that are trying to land base chiropractic, whether it's inside the profession or outside the profession, they like to get adjusted too. just letting everybody know. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, the adjustment is amazing. Of course, uh, there's the old saying, you know, the, the shoemakers, kids have no shoes type of thing. So sometimes as a clinician, we don't get as much or the, as, as good of care as we, we should. Uh, but every time I get adjusted, I say, man, could you imagine if you never got adjusted and you just lived with that discomfort or that pain or that abnormality? And it's so simple and it, it is extremely powerful. And, and that's uh, why I loved upper cervical because, uh, man, this, I don't know if you've ever been adjusted knee chest, but that is one of the most powerful feeling adjustments you're ever going to get. And, uh, and, you know, we used to use a, a, a thermographic scanner back in the day, you know, oh, yeah. and then, uh, and then we'd look to see if there was like nervous system change. And that's really one of the reasons I felt I moved on from upper cervical. I wanted to see more of that nervous system change. I wanted to see brainstem reflexes change. I wanted to see cortical, uh, activation change. I wanted to see, you know, somatosensory evoked potentials change. So I said, well, let's, yeah, we could use the scanner, but let's correlate it to all this other cool stuff that we could measure. Now the DNA looking at the methylation status, to me, that's the ultimate. I don't think there's anything that's going to tell us more about how we're influencing the longevity of, of a patient uh, than that. So I'm excited for that. And we're, we're actually uh, trying to raise money. We have a GoFundMe page. I don't know if you would post that, but I sent that to you. Uh, because we want to, we want to do a study that shows that when we intervene, we change the methylation status of the patient. This is something that the chiropractic school should pick up on. Uh, any chiropractic researchers, it's a really easy thing to do. It's using, uh, blood, uh, analysis technology, which is, you know, the standard of, of assessing someone's metabolic health. And of course, now we're looking directly at that DNA there's nothing going to be more powerful uh, uh, that we can that we can use as a as a, a vetting measure to to show that what we're doing is really changing the uh, expression of someone's uh, DNA. Well, I will definitely uh, email that out to our um, email list for you, and. Uh, If people wanted to support you in that measure or connect with you further about the Scully Fit Method, where can we send them to? Uh, You could always go to uh, um, the uh, website, which is scully-fit.com. That's scully, S-C-O-L-I with a hyphen sign, fit.com. You could find me on Google by searching either that or my name. Uh, the GoFundMe is uh, under the Scoliosis Care Foundation. So you could go to GoFundMe.com and look up Scoliosis Care Foundation. We're a 501c3 uh, uh, nonprofit organization. So uh, we fund that and have for years out of our own pockets. Uh, everything we've done over the years, we've done basically funding it ourselves. Uh, the, the epigenetic study uh, it will cost us about thirty thousand dollars to do uh, enough patients, so there's some power. And and ultimately, we want to create a a risk progression score for patients, so we can identify when someone is at risk for progression versus when they aren't. Just treating their curve doesn't necessarily mean they're at, at decreased risk. So we have to figure out what treatments for what patients really reduce their risk. We could do that through that testing. So I'm trying to uh, organize that. Um, I have a, I have a Facebook group called adult scoliosis learners. Uh, we have a couple of thousand members there. Um, 
I post a lot of the uh, technology there, a lot of the evidence from the literature, uh, which really supports what we're doing, treating scoliosis as a, a non-orthopedic problem or as a neurologic problem. Well, Dr. Mark, um, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank cool. you for uh, giving it all. Thank you for uh, leaving no, uh, no <laughs> stones unturned. I'm going to yeah. outpassion the competition. I'll tell you that. That's yeah, one thing, for sure. One thing you know about it, I'm going to outpassion you. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I I love the message. I love your consistency. I love the drive. And um, like BJ Palmer would always say, I love you because you love the things I love. Awesome. And man. that's episode 535 of the Cairo Hustle podcast. Uh, go check it out, scoli-fit.com. Uh, go to his GoFundMe page, Scoliosis Care Foundation. Um, give it your... Uh, your uh, treasure to this one. And we could also use uh, people to support chiropractic with their time and talents as well. But this one needs your treasure and uh, go to his Facebook group, adult scoliosis learners and uh, support this man, support his mission, support uh, the future of chiropractic. And with kind that, words. thank you. And with that, um, let's just keep on doing the right things for each other and supporting this beautiful profession of chiropractic. And I'm going to close out by telling everyone like I always do. You guys are just one story away. Keep hustling. I'll see you guys on the next episode. Dr. Mark, have a good night now, okay? Awesome, man. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for being our guest. It was great. Cool. Yeah. Good talking with you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Cairo Hustle. Don't forget to subscribe and check back next week to continue hustling.